to LOA Today. I'm Walt Thiessen. I've been doing this podcast since September of 2012, and boy, are my lips tired. This is your daily dose of happy. We are so happy you decided to join us today. Our friend Sam Page can't join us today, but uh, he'll be back next week. He's actually pet sitting today, which shows just what kind of a heart he has, uh, as we all know. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of hoping one of these visits, we're going to get another uh, piece out of his album that he's put together. He, he, Karen, he's a pianist. Oh, okay. He, he uh, just recently recorded an album in the studio where he literally recorded every song just ad lib, whatever came out. That's the kind That's of guy he is. He's phenomenal. able to just, just improvise and have beauty and it's beautiful stuff. It's all very beautiful. It's lyrical. It's just, it's really wild what he's able to do. So, but we aren't going to have him this week, but we'll get him for uh, next week for sure. Okay. Uh, but I do have Karen Hale joining me today from new Cleveland radio.net. Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't remember exactly how we connected through Podbatch. I don't remember what, what the, the sequence was there, but uh, I know that when I saw your profile, Karen, I was interested that you give a lot of attention to life for people after, but 60, 65, something like that, which well, I think is, is great. I love that. I mean, we, so many people think about, uh, you know, senior years as, oh, well, you know, you, 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 you take it slow, you, you know, life is slowing down, everything's falling apart and so forth. But no, not these days. I, actually, we're now in, in a stage, I think, where more and more people are living longer and living healthier. So those old rules kind of go out the, the door, they, don't they? They certainly do. I mean, you know, as I tell people, there once was a time I thought I'm not old enough to do something. <laughs> and then when I thought I was old enough to do it, I was told I was too old. You're to too it. old. Oh, dear. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's just how, how our society looks at things. Mm. And uh, I refuse to be pigeonholed and told that I can't do something because of my gender, because of my age. Mm. Um, you know, I can do things today that 20, 30, even 40 years ago, I never would have thought yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, life is a lot different than when my grandmother was in her 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when she came over from Europe, uh, she looked like she was 60 or 70 when she was in her 20s. Yeah, um, sure. And that's that's the difference. And yeah. um, hey, let's live our best life. That's all we can do. I agree. In fact, I was thinking back to when I was a kid. And how the people who were in my circle, grandparents mainly, who were in that age group, how they behaved, how they thought, and so forth, it's entirely different. Yep, so absolutely. It's, it's like it's like wildly different. It's it's hard. It's almost hard to explain to the to the current generations how different it was. If you didn't go through that, how do you explain that? I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> it it is quite difficult. I mean. Today, I was looking through some pictures um, I wanted to post on Facebook, hmm. and um, I had a picture of my mother's mother with my two older brothers when they were, one was an infant and one was about four years old. Hmm. And my grandmother at that point looked the same to me as she did almost 20 years later. Yeah. And same type of clothing and, you know, mm -hmm. carried her body in the same way. And uh, I remember my mother, when my mother was about 60 years old, my mother lost a lot of weight. She was wearing blue jeans and T-shirts. Oh, wow. And it was like, hey, you know, uh, if she can do it at 60, when I get to be 60, yeah. I'm going to do the same thing. Sure. So, why not? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's cool. So so how did uh, New Cleveland Radio get started? Tell me about that. Well, Interestingly enough, um, my son it was a business major in college, hmm. and he really wanted to work in the sports industry, but oh. the small college he was going to didn't have any leads for him. Hmm. And so for his internship, they put him at an internet radio station. Oh. And I realized he was doing what I had dreamt about doing. Really? When I was his age. No kidding. Yeah. I wanted to go into broadcasting. My parents said... No woman will ever make it. Oh, well. And that was in the wow. late 60s. And in the yeah. late 60s, they were sort of right. That know? was pretty much true. Yeah. W yeah women's exactly. roles, so to speak, were yeah. pretty limited at that point. So when he was graduating, I decided to go back to get my master's. And once I got my master's, 
um, I was very unhappy in corporate America. Mm. And I said, I'm going to leave corporate America and I'm going to do what I think is important. And um, I started blogging. I started creating websites and podcasting. Mm. And I had no idea what podcasting was back in 2010, other than <laughs> uh, you use a computer and you need an internet and you're hoping that people will listen to you. Absolutely. I, I started in 2012. And so you started roughly in the same era I did. And you were on your own. You didn't have Zoom. We didn't have StreamYard. We didn't have PodMatch. We didn't have all these resources. We had exactly. to kind of figure the whole thing out ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. So and, that was, that was the and I did, And I did it because, well, number one, because I saw my son doing it and, and doing well at it. Mm -hmm. And thinking, boy, that's what I've always wanted to do. Mm. But more so the fact that I wanted to help people get out of a rut. Mm. And I saw so many of my friends and neighbors um, not happy in what they were doing. Um, and I thought, you know what? There's got to be a way to sh express, you know, your unhappiness without being doom and gloom. And so that's what I did. Mm -hmm. I talked about the fact that, yes, I left corporate America. At first, it was depressing. But then, you know, I wanted to tell people why I left mm -hmm. and what I thought I could do to be happy. And I realized I've been happier doing this than any other job in my life. And I'm not making a fraction of what I was back in corporate America. <laughs> I totally get it. I totally agree. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I've mentioned it actually many times here on the program. I'm curious to know. I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what your answer is going to be to this next question. Okay. My listeners know what the answer is because I say it all the time. But I'm curious to know what your answer is going to be. What's the biggest, wonder, most wonderful thing that you find by doing your podcast? What's the, what, what's the thing that you appreciate the most? I'm learning more about myself mm -hmm. and how to take care of myself, oh, okay. which I never did in the past. Mm -hmm. I was brought up, um, make somebody happy and then you're going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so I was making mom and dad happy, my older brothers, uh, grandparents, uh, friends, neighbors, but I never felt totally satisfied. Right, because you're a people pleaser at that point, and that's not pleasing to you. Right. Well, I was pleasing all of them. They were pleasing. Was, yeah, they, was, were, they loved it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and I suffered. And when, when I was told I was doing it wrong, hmm. when I would say, well, how do you do it right? Nobody knew. Hmm. Nobody knew what to tell me. Um, and so when I went back to school, I realized I was doing that for me. I had to prove to myself that I could do it. Um, and then once I realized I could do it and I could be in the honors class, which I didn't understand how that was happening. I was working full time, <laughs> had a family and going to school and getting honors. Um, that's when I realized that we have to give ourselves more credit. No kidding. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's, it's one of the, it's, it's a characteristic, I think of a people pleaser. This again, another topic we have talked about a lot, yeah. which is people pleasers. You're right. They don't really feel good about themselves. What's ironic though, is how a people pleaser very rarely is able to receive. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh -huh. Like, you know, you go out to lunch with somebody and you know, they, they offer to pick up the check and you say, Oh no, no, I got the check. Cause you can't receive the gift of the check. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it's and like I, a perfect example have, of how it works. And I have to tell you that my husband, um, he's my second and final husband. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we've been together 38 years. Wow. And it took me almost 38 years to accept a compliment from him. And he's constantly wow. complimenting me. And I would look at him and go, no, my hair doesn't look that good. No, this really doesn't look so good on me. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I didn't do that so well. And then I finally realized that I was I was taking his happiness away. And when I sure. realized it, it was like, oh, my God, why am I doing that? You know, if he tells me that I look beautiful, thank you. 
I mm. appreciate that. Yeah. If you tell me that this is the best dinner I've ever made you, wow, thank you. Um, and so it's only within the last couple of years that I'm now learning how to take a compliment, and especially from him. And that's important. It is. It is. And, and you, maybe you weren't really taking his happiness away, but you you were demonstrating, a, in a sense, a lack of appreciation for what he was giving. That right. might be a better way to say it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's great. And your, your, your answer was an excellent answer. It's actually different from my answer about what it is I appreciate most about my podcast, um, our podcast, because I have so many good co-hosts here. Uh, but it's a great answer. I love the answer. My, my answer is I love the perspectives because I, I love talking with all kinds of people, getting all kinds of perspectives. But it dovetails with your answer. I mean, your answer was about how you learned about uh, about yourself. And I did, too. That was one of my main motivators in starting the podcast in the first place. But what it evolved to for me is I also learned so much from somebody else, from many, many Absolutely. somebody else's. And, and I mean, I've gotten to the point now where I think the different perspectives that I encounter here on the show and off the show are the best things that happen in my life. Well, and I find I'm less judgmental than I've ever been in my life. Right. And I didn't realize I was judgmental until um, I just took this um, seminar course about mm -hmm. um, identifying our strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And one of my strengths, uh, weaknesses was being judgmental. Mm. And it really upset me when I got, got it back. It was like, no, no, no. But then <laughs> I thought about it and it's like, that's the culture I grew up in. Mm -hmm. And even though I kept saying that I wasn't, um, I had to start looking at things differently. And, uh, especially with my, my two sons, um, mm. You know, they'll come and say something to me. And my first reaction is to tell them what I think. And I'm realizing I don't have to tell them what I think. Nope. I can just listen. And what a difference that makes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. Uh, the, the, the piece that I also attach to that is the appreciation piece in that when someone shares something with me, I don't always pull it off. So I, I can't say I always remember to do this, but on many occasions I learned to do this, especially I'm learning more and more to do it because of the podcast, because you kind of learn to do it when you're with a, a guest or a co-host. But I try to make it a point to find what can I appreciate about what they just said? What is it that I can appreciate about their viewpoint on this? Because what I've learned over time is that the more that I can appreciate, no matter, even if it's something I don't like, by the way, it could, they could be say, saying something that just really turns me off. But if I can find something to appreciate about it, something to say, well, yeah, I don't necessarily like that, but I appreciate this about it. Boy, do I, that's where I do my learning. That's where I pick up the most information. That's where I learn most. You talked about learning about yourself. That's where I learn most about myself by picking up what they're saying from their perspective and saying, wow, I never would have thought about it that way. And then suddenly it starts filling in pieces for me. Well, and you know, last night um, here in Cleveland, they had uh, the Republican and the Democrat um, gentlemen who are going for the Senate seat in Ohio. Mm -hmm. a, a debate. And as I was watching it, um, usually, you know, I just take a side. I say to myself, you know, I'm Democrat, I'm Republican, I'm independent, whatever. And right. that's all I really want to listen yeah, to. Which most people. But yeah. last night, I actually, and my husband too, we actually listened to both sides. Mm. And afterwards, I could say to him, you know, Gentleman A said these things, and I really believe in that. Mm. And Gentleman B said these things that I like. Yeah. And now I'm looking at them and it's like, I'm not looking at them by party. I'm looking at them as individuals yeah. and, you know, what they believe in and how that resonates with me. And it's not always easy to do that. No, but, it's a challenge. Yeah. But, you know, I think we have to do more of that because we are all intermingled. It's not like, you know, when my parents were growing up and, you know, every denomination lived in a certain part of the city. Mm -hmm. You sort of brush sides as you went into the supermarket. Right, but, right. You know, um, in, my parents used to always tell me, you know, yes, the Italian families lived on those four blocks and the Polish families lived on those four blocks. <laughs> and, and I would look at them and go, really? 
<laughs> yeah, that they came over, you know, from Europe, and that's how they settled. Yeah, oh, sure, yeah. And but today, you know, we're all intermingled, and that I think is a great thing. I think so too. Yeah, and, and the thing that I find to be most enjoyable about what we're talking about here is that early in my life, people were mainly how can I describe it? They were mainly ciphers, I guess you could say in my calculation, like, Oh, this is how people behave, you know, generalizing and all that kind of right. stuff. They, they weren't individuals. And to the degree that they were individuals in my mind, many of them, I didn't want to know anyway. So I was just kind of turned off to even considering them as individuals. Right. What has transpired over time, particularly through doing the podcast, but even before is as I've learned how to appreciate perspectives more, I see them as individuals more. And I appreciate them as individuals more. And I find in many cases, they're pretty cool as individuals. And that's, that was the surprise. Yeah. P people who previously I would have thought was, I'm thinking, you know, that's pretty cool. I, it doesn't necessarily mean I want to hang out with that person all the time, but I like that about them. Well, I interviewed somebody this morning for our, sh for my show. And when she first came on, she was, um, a little stiff, mm -hmm. um, she sort of told me how she wanted the podcast to go, which was mm -hmm. fine. Sure. But the way she first told me, it was like, you know, okay, uh, should we switch seats or something? <laughs> um, but it was funny because once we got going, I felt like she was my best friend. Oh, cool. I understood everything where she was going. And we were, I mean, we were laughing. Um, we were agreeing a couple areas we disagreed in but we disagreed in a very friendly way mm -hmm. and when i got off i thought that was interesting because if i would have kept that first image in my head that podcast would have been really pretty bad yeah sure but i i let it go my thought was you know if she if she takes over that's okay because mm -hmm. i'm here to talk to her about what she does and how she got through the maze of life. And that would be fine. But it was interesting. The two of us were interviewing each other and I yeah. loved it. It That's was really great. nice. I like that. I, I find that uh, kind of piggybacking on what you, you were just saying there. I find that the, the skill that you kind of learn when you're a podcast host is how to see past the preconceptions, which is what you just did when you when you described that you saw past the preconceptions, which, by the way, is not what most of us do in society. Most of us <laughs> get stuck on the preconceptions. You know, this is what I assume about this person from the, the bits that I know. So therefore, it must be true. But yeah. it turns out that's actually a very shallow view of people. Yes. Now, the person who has that viewpoint doesn't think they're being shallow. Right. Right. You know, they think they're be, they, they probably think they're actually looking with great depth. But how interesting that until you're willing to look past that, you find out there's more depth. Well, do you think it's because um, we communicate with each other, but we're not listening? But oh, when yeah. we do get that little bit of listening in the beginning, and we think that person is, um, angry or defensive mm -hmm. that can sort of change the way we go about having the conversation. Yeah. But what I've realized, and especially through my training is that I have to be careful about my tone and my body language mm -hmm. because so many people from my past have said I was very, very rigid. Really? I never okay. thought, and I never thought I was. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so once I started podcasting, even when I was doing audio podcasting, I would have the camera going, at least for myself. Oh, no kidding. Okay. I, because if I looked angry at myself, uh, I would think, I wonder how it's really sounding. Great point. Yeah. And, you know, most of us don't want to look in the mirror. Come on. I mean, let's be honest. Um, we want to look in the mirror for five minutes to say our hair is right. You know, our shirt is buttoned properly. And then we want to walk away from the mirror because almost everybody I know sees their flaws when they look in the mirror. Oh, yeah. so they, they don't want to be staring at them when they're doing a podcast. 
but that's what I started doing. That, that takes and guts. It, it helped so much because mm -hmm. um, every once in a while I could hear, I would start to hear the tone in my headset mm -hmm. and I'd look at myself and go, uh oh, you got there it is again. You better, you better change it up right now. <laughs> yeah, I hear you on that. Very, very true. I love that. You're reminding me actually uh, about the first time I tried to do mirror exercises. I don't know if you've ever done mirror work where you basically talk to yourself in the mirror and right. love yourself and all that kind of thing. Uh, and and I've, I've told this before that to, and, and other guests laugh at it. So I'll tell you to get a little chuckle out of you. But my first session uh, doing mirror work went something like this. I love you. Oh, I can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first session. <laughs> I can relate. Yes. <laughs> but see, I grew up with a father who every morning would go into the bathroom and he'd look in the mirror and he'd bellow throughout the whole house. Good morning, handsome. <laughs> I love it. You know, and the rest of us were like, oh, we want to sleep a few more minutes. <laughs> um, but he's he did set the tone. He set the tone so perfectly because he knew that we were all asleep. We weren't going to tell him he was handsome or good looking. Mm -hmm. And he needed to get his day started. It was great I, that he did that every day probably served him well. Oh, it, it certainly did. Um, yeah. And my father was uh, a people pleaser, I see. but mm -hmm. he chose how to please people. What do you mean? Which I didn't. Meaning um, if he really knew that um, it would be helpful to you today on your podcast um, for him to come to the studio and it make sure everything was running right. Mm -hmm. If he knew that was important to you, but if he also knew that he would feel good doing that for you, ah. he then would come do it. Okay. But if he knew that, Hey, I'm too tired. I don't want to do it. I know this would make Walt happy, but you know what? I'm going to find something else at a different time and I'll make him happy. And I didn't understand that until, you know, much, much later in life. Yeah. He was gone by then. Hmm. Uh, but I look up in the heavens and I thank him for, you know, that bit of information that I didn't really use until now. But, um, you know, my my youngest son moved back in the house with us for a couple of months. And um, I was, you know, very clear on you take care of your stuff. I'm not going to do your laundry. You do all that. Mm -hmm. But the other day he was having a really rough day. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt that it was something I wanted to do. I saw his laundry was overflowing and it was just something that I knew he would appreciate. Mm -hmm. And I could do it for him. Mm -hmm. And my husband saw me doing it and he said, why are you doing it? And I said, because he needs a little TLC. This will help. But I know he's going to thank me this time. Because in the past, when he lived here, it just became routine. Mom didn't like the laundry all over the floor, so she picked it up and washed it. Mm -hmm. But I was so right. He came to me afterwards, and he said, thank you. He said, mm. I'm just in a down mood. But, yeah, I need clean clothes to work tomorrow. Mm. And... So I'm now learning that you can't please everybody 24 seven, but when you do make sure it's something that you want to do. I agree with that. Yeah. And I, I don't even think about it in terms of pleasing people anymore. I, I like to help people, but I don't think about it in terms of pleasing them. I think about it in terms of pleasing myself that I'm helping them. Okay. That, that That's the way it's I like to do way. it. Because yeah. if, if it doesn't please me, I don't really want to do it. But if it does please me, I enjoy it. I like helping somebody. You know, assuming now I should put a caveat in. The caveat in is I have to know that they actually want the help. If yes. I don't know that they want the help, I actually don't want to get involved in, in even helping them on something because that can usually backfire. But as long as I have some reason to know, ideally they ask for help. But even if they didn't ask for help, if I ask them, would you be would you like me to help you with this? Yes, then I love doing it. Right. 
Well, that, that's a different. That's a good people pleaser. And a good you people don't get, pleaser. <laughs> well, you don't you don't get burned out, okay? True. And for most of my life, I was getting burned out. You mm -hmm. know, uh, I'd go visit my mother up in Michigan, and my mother would say to me, um, "I think you should call your aunt." Okay. Um, any special reason why I should call her? Well, you're in town. No. Oh. Okay. Am I going to see her? Oh, no, no. We're too busy. You're not going to see her. Then why am I calling her? But I was pleasing my mother mm -hmm. and pleasing my aunt. And I wasn't getting any pleasure out of it. I didn't mm -hmm. even know what to say to my aunt mm -hmm. uh, sometimes. And so I, I remember telling my mother one day, you know, I can call anybody from my home and it's not long distance. Mm -hmm. So from now on, please don't ask me to call anybody in particular. If it's somebody that I want to call, I will. And I found yeah. myself calling my aunt more regularly mm. because I called her when I wanted to. Yeah. And when I heard how happy she was to hear my voice, you know, it encouraged me, Hey, mm -hmm. do it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think what's important about it is that we humans tend to learn from a relatively early age to, we're calling it people pleasing, but I think it's a little bit of a restricted title or topic name. I think of it more like do things that are expected of us because they're expected of us rather than do things that we enjoy because they feel good. Right. And so, the things that are expected of us become chores. They, exactly. they, they can actually become dead weights. And yep. now all of a sudden, because we're doing what's expected of us, we find ourselves in a place where we don't feel good about helping others. Isn't that interesting how that works? Yep. Well, and that happened to me in corporate America. Oh, really? I, I loved, I love the essence of my job. Mm -hmm. Um, I was um, I was a recruiter at a private college, mm -hmm. and I loved helping the students who came in identify what it was that they wanted to do, what, mm. what course of study, why did they want to do it. And most of them would come in and say to me, I want to be a nurse because I love helping people. Mm -hmm. And I could turn that around in 30 seconds and say, well, I love helping people too but I would be a terrible nurse. So let's <laughs> talk about how else you can help people mm -hmm. because maybe nursing is not the career you want. And I would get them to talk to me about certain things like they don't like the sight of blood. Um, mm -hmm. They don't like touching other people. It's like, mm -hmm. well, then you're not going to be a very good nurse. Okay. You're not going to enjoy it. That's right. You're not going to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Um, you're probably not going to get through school because of some of the things you're going to have to do. All right. So let's talk about other ways of helping. But I loved what I, what I was doing, but the culture in that college was horrible. Hmm. Um, and they have made a lot of changes in the last 10 years, but back then it was like, you know, as soon as a student would walk out of my office my director would come in and say, so are they signed up? Did they sign up for the class? Did, you know, did they go through financial aid? And be like, oh, just give me a break. I'm trying to help them. Mm -hmm. um, and after 10 years, I finally said, I just can't do this yeah, anymore. I don't blame and you. when I walked away, I cannot tell you how many of my students stayed in touch with me. And even wow. to this day. Nice. Um, and that's what I knew that I was doing something good for them. Mm -hmm. I felt good about it. But when I realized that it wasn't a good fit for me anymore, I knew that I had to leave because, yeah. um, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to push somebody to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a degree that they're never going to use, mm. or they're never going to finish because of what the caseload is. So, um, you know, I think my transition from helping students to, you know, developing the podcast where we talk about what it is that makes us happy. Mm -hmm. What can we do? You know, that 
I, I'm not going to be sent out to um, the farm and sit on a rocking chair because of a certain age, you know, sure. I, I can find a new career. I may not be employable by some company, <laughs> but I can employ myself. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. I'm thinking also, you, you talked about your career working with the students. I'm thinking about uh, modern day students that I either have interacted with or know. And what I've learned in minimal contact with them about what they're experiencing, what they're dealing with, the one theme comes through really loud and clear to me anyway. And I'm curious to know what your take is on this. But the theme I keep hearing over and over again is they're going to college so they can get a job that makes them a lot of money. It's all about the money. And to give you an example of just how strong that programming seems to be for the current generation entering college, uh, I was at, uh, actually my wife and I were in a resort town on the coast, the East Coast in Massachusetts a couple of years ago. And the young lady behind the counter at this particular shop that we'd stopped and we were you know, doing a little uh, window shopping. My wife loves to do that. Um, my wife was picking something out to buy and I got chatting with the girl behind the counter. And uh, well, you know, so you're doing this as a summer job and all that kind of thing. She says, oh yeah. I said, what are you doing? Are you going to school? She says, well, yeah, I start uh, uh, at Fairfield University, which is actually fairly near where uh, my wife and I live. Um, I said, oh, that's great. You know, What, what are you going to study? She says, I don't know. I haven't figured it out. I said, well, you know, that's fairly common, but uh, um, what, what would you like to do? She says, well, something that makes me a lot of money. And I said, okay, well, I understand that, but can I make a suggestion? She says, sure. I said, look first for something that you would love to do. And she had the shocked look on her face. And the words that came out of her mouth were, I've never heard anyone say that before. You know, it is, it's sad because... I grew up in a family that my father didn't make a lot of money, but he made enough that, you know, we could live comfortably. Um, and he encouraged all of us kids to go to college and get a degree, mm -hmm. but they never talked about, you know, getting that job that was going to make us rich. It mm -hmm. was getting the job that you are going to enjoy mm -hmm. because my father believed that, you know, you'd get a job at the age of 25 and you'd have it for 50 years. Which was the way it was done. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and both my brothers and I, um, you know, we got our degrees. We've we've done decently, but it never was about money for me. Mm. Um, I wanted to be comfortable. I wanted to make sure I could pay my bills. Sure. But. It wasn't that I had to have the big fancy house and the big fancy car right. and all the vacations. Yeah. Um, and yet many of my friends were like that. Mm -hmm. But now I'm seeing that I have two sons. One is 45, one is 32. And they're almost in different generations. <laughs> um, the oldest one um just, you know, was determined that he was going to go to college. He was going to get his degree. He was going to make good money. And he has, He, but he really doesn't like what he does anymore. Mm. But he works 24-7. Wow. He's an attorney. Mm. Um, and he basically doesn't have any life. Yeah. Now there's my younger son who sports is his love. Okay. And as long as he is working in sports, he is happy. Mm. Doesn't make any difference if all he can eat is peanut butter and jelly tonight. <laughs> He's working in a field that he loves. Yeah. And that's the difference. And I I coach kids on the weekend uh, at a big box store. Mm -hmm. And I tell them, you know, don't look at this as your lifelong career unless this is what you really like to do. Right. You know, do you get excited when you walk in the door here? And most of them will say no, but they're making decent money for their mm, age. Sure. That's fine. But if you're going to go to work like this every single day of your life, find something else you can do on the off hours mm. that is going to provide you that excitement and happiness. Because without right. it, you're just walking through life. You're not well, living it. You're setting yourself up for burnout. That's what burnout is. Yeah. 
Exactly. Burn, burnout is when you, you're you're working for the wrong reasons, and and you just can only. I, I love the way I can't remember who the author was. One of of the more famous authors out there in self help world mentioned that you can't give something to somebody until you have it to give. And what happens is, if you're doing a job that you really don't love, after a while, you run out of something to give. And you're that's where the burnout correct. happens. Right. Well, and I, you know, I learned that this past year. Um, so last year, I was recording anywhere from four to eight shows a day. Woo! Wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and that's and that included some of my, you know, client podcasters who po podcast through me. But I didn't have any time to breathe. Yeah. And I was forward. enjoying it until right around the first of the year. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of things that I wanted to do. And I looked at my schedule and it was like, I can't fit it in. I had a dentist appointment, which I put off because, hey, I'm busy. Mm -hmm. And then I sat myself down in front of my calendar one day and I went through it and I started rescheduling everybody. And I said, I don't want to burn out. Yeah. I want to enjoy myself. And so what I'm doing is I'm, I've decided how many I'm willing to do each day per week. And that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there have been other weeks that I'll look at that schedule and say, next week is too full. I'm going to contact the people who I have scheduled and I'm going to rearrange the schedule because I want to give everybody my all. And if I can't, then I'm not going to do it. And so, you know, I learned the hard way. Yes. Did I enjoy it in the beginning? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. sure. I mean, I was patting myself on the back that I was meeting this person and that person and learning this and learning that. But then all of a sudden it was like, I don't have the energy mm -hmm. and I want to do other things. And that's what I put into my calendar. So to ask the obvious question, which probably has the obvious answer, where does the energy come from? Um, the energy comes from the things I love to do. Mm. You know, um, having this conversation with you today. I've had two other conversations today. Um, and each one has gone in a slightly different direction. Sure. And it gives me time to sit back and think about, you know, Am I being true to myself? Mm -hmm. um, and I found that out in one of my podcasts the other day that um, I said something that I won't say it was a lie, but it wasn't really a full truth. And um, I called up the person that was my guest and I apologized to them. I really? said, I don't know why I said that. I said, but if you go back and listen, I said, um, I don't know where that voice came from, but it, it came out. And I said, probably because I was tired and I wasn't giving you my all. Hmm. And they hadn't noticed it, but you know what? Um, if I feel I haven't given you my all, I'm going to apologize. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I realized that today was the day that you and I were going to be doing this podcast, I rearranged my earlier schedule because I didn't want to be burned out. Oh. when we when we got together at four o'clock well thank you for that both my audience and i thank you for that, that was, <laughs> that's very considerate i appreciate that oh, so that's, that's important i like that um you know as you're describing that i'm thinking to myself that well i'm also feeling to myself that when you're on the topic and th th this is obviously the topic that's behind all the topics i'm sure you address a lot of topics particularly related to senior living and so forth sure but the, but the topic behind the topic is this joy this, you know, doing what you love, finding what you love and, and getting the energy out of that. Because when, when we're giving that kind of energy and, and getting that kind of energy, what we're really doing is being a, a conductor of energy in a sense. We're, we're, we're like that metal bar that you know, the, the electricity flows through or yep. the wire or whatever. And when, when we behave like that, what I, I mean, I, I don't know what your spiritual beliefs are. I, I tend to believe in what they call source energy and all that kind of thing. And, I, I see myself as being part of source energy. So I see that as me being in flow with the rest of source and everybody else is part of that flow too. And, and the more that you let that flow go, 
the better life gets. You don't even have to work at it. It just kind of flows. It's all, right. you know, it, the flow is there. Oh, the energy is there. Hey, you know, everybody feeding time. Let's go. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I shared this story this morning. Um, when I first met my husband, he was in the photo industry. Mm -hmm. And um, we met at a friend's wedding. We really hit it off. He called me a couple of times during the week. And then he said to me, you know, next weekend, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh doing a photo show. Mm -hmm. show. Um, if you'd like to come out, I would love to have you there. Uh, and you could maybe help me. You know, mm -hmm. what do you know about photography? And uh, I said, well, my father gave me this old camera. Uh, I know there's film in it. Uh, it has a bunch of settings. I have no idea how to use them. <laughs> and he said, uh, oh, so you don't take many pictures. And this was back in the early 80s. And I mm. said, no. Mm. Uh, he said, well, bring it along with you. Um, you know, maybe, you know, I, I can help you know how to use it. I said, sure. okay, fine. So I get there and uh, he was in darkroom sales at the time. Okay. And he said, you can help me with this one thing. And he showed me this four by six Lucite little thing that had all these different colors in it. And he said, this is for um, the dark room when you want to get the colors right. And I said, okay. And he showed me how you use it. And so I picked up on that. And everybody who came to the booth, I talked to them about this four by six Lucite thing. And it didn't cost a lot of money. And you can get the true colors. He said he typically sold maybe a half a dozen a month. I can hardly wait. How many did he sell? A thousand. <laughs> he said, what are you doing? He said, I've never, I mean, said, the company is going to like wonder what's going on. And I said, well, this is what I've been doing. Haven't you watched? And I showed him and he goes, oh my God. He said, you probably sold this to people who don't even have a dark room. <laughs> I said, Possibly. I don't know. <laughs> but that's when I realized the ability I had in learning. Because prior to that, it always felt like a struggle. Mm -hmm. And so I took it from there that I can do just about anything I want to do. Um, and about six years later, my husband left the photo industry and he was working for a very small company at the time called Microsoft ah. uh, in, their, in their early days. In their infancy. And um, they were looking for beta testers oh, okay. and alpha testers. Yeah. And my husband volunteered me. Volunteered you? Yes. And I oh, said. Wait, wait, wait. No, hold on here. Wait, where does he get off volunteering you? I'm curious about that. Well, he knew what I had done in the photo industry. So he figured if I did this, I could become a whiz. Well, you and probably he, could, but did you want to? <laughs> well, I didn't understand it in the beginning, oh, but I'm okay. glad he did it because right. um, we ended up getting a Mac and a PC. And I love the fact that I can, even to this day, if somebody says, do you know how to do something? You know, I'll be honest. No, I don't know how to do it, but let me look at it. And if I'm interested, I'm going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. If I'm not interested, you're going to know in the first five minutes and I'm just <laughs> going to say no good. No. Um, and so I became an alpha and beta tester for Microsoft and mm. loved it for years. Um, and I encourage people, you know, don't wait until you think it's the right time, because if you wait, it's never going to be the right time. And, um, you know, I was. 40 years old when I was working for Microsoft as a tester. That was my first experience really with computers, mm. you know? Um, and today I now do training on the weekend in a big box store. Oh. Uh, I train the customers, I train the, the staff and it's like, you know, it's like falling off a log for me. And I will have people who will walk in and say, you're a trainer, you know all this, you use these things? And it's like, yeah, I do. And it's, it's amazing because um, I'm evolving with the times. 
And mm -hmm. I love it. And I think we all should be able to do that. I'm guessing also that you love doing that training in the big box store. I do. Although I will say the big box stores are not as much fun as they once were. But okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. That's yeah. okay. Hey, the main thing is that you're enjoying what you're doing. That's, Absolutely. that's the theme we've been following here, right? You have to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when I walk out of there, and I'm only in there for like four hours at a time. When I walk out after four hours, I'm exhausted, but mm -hmm. I put all my energy into it. Yeah. Um, now, my husband does the same thing, but he's low energy. Mm -hmm. You know, he just, he's there. He does his job. He likes doing it. Um, but I'm like the energizer buddy. I walk <laughs> in and I don't stop until the four hours is over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's cool though. Yeah. That's great. The, Cause you know yourself on, on top of everything else, which yeah. by the way is kind of where I want to go with the next thing here, because um, I want to get back to new Cleveland radio. You talked a little bit um, about what it's about and you talked a little bit about how you got it started, but where are you going with it? <laughs> so when we started it, I started it with my son who is um, my sports in history guy. And um, he was doing all the sport podcasting and we figured to, if we were really going to grow it, we had to have something other than just sports. Mm -hmm. So he said, okay, you bring your talents over, you develop your shows and we'll intermingle them. And we did that for about six, seven months. Mm -hmm. And then he went to work for a um, major league baseball club in Cleveland, who at that time were called the Cleveland Indians. Now the Guardians. Um, they yeah. are now the Guardians, and yeah. they are in the playoffs. They are. Um, yeah, I just had to get that out there. Um, <laughs> but um, when he had to move away from the radio station, um, I just took it, and I sort of like turned it around. I got rid of some of the shows we were doing because they just, they were too local. Mm -hmm. They weren't there was no energy behind them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I started working with a um, a group of people up in upstate New York at uh, in Saratoga Springs. Oh, my. Uh, Cafe Lena. I don't know if you know. Oh, I, uh, I grew up in Schenectady, New York. I've oh, been to Cafe, Le Cafe Lena. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So well. um, for the first three years, I started interviewing all of their guests, all their musicians. Um and then that sort of developed in, you know, avoid the maze because mm -hmm. I was talking to people who, some of them who didn't become true musicians until they were 40, 50 years old. Yeah. And others who started out in their teens and were in their 80s and still performing. Mm -hmm. And I just got so excited that there is all this talent in the world. Oh, yeah. And some of us miss out on it because we don't know what local talent really is. Mm -hmm. And so I started, you know, working with them. I worked with another musical PR group. Um, and then I started working with coaches mm -hmm. because I found that so many of us want to find answers. And Absolutely. the best way to find an answer is to ask questions. That's absolutely right. Yeah. By the way, for people who are curious, Cafe Lena is a very, very unusual. You won't find this kind of establishment almost anywhere. There are very few establishments like Cafe Lena, but it's an old fashioned coffee house yep. that brings in all kinds of usually folk musicians, although there could be a wide variety of musical styles. Some of the more famous people who have played there, Bob Dylan. Don McLean. There have been a yep. number of very famous acts that have gone through there, but it's usually either local or regional acts that are very talented and come in and they get the gig there. And it's a, it's in very high demand among the musicians to, Absolutely. Get, to be a musician and get a gig at Cafe Lena is a big, big deal. And the reason it's such a big deal is that they have a great following of, of regular listeners who come in to hear all the different concerts that, that go on there. So it, it, it's like its own community, its own culture. And I wanted it to let is. people know about that because it's so different from anything else out well, there. Well, in they have renovated the place in the last couple of years. Have they? Oh, okay. Uh, I so haven't been there. In finally, years. There's finally an elevator so people can really get. Oh, there up is. Yes. <laughs> um, Good for them. I'm glad they put that in. <laughs> but they also um, stream their shows. Oh, they do. Oh, and okay. 
when you watch it from home on your computer, on your TV, you feel like you're there because mm. where the camera is, it's like in the first row. So you feel okay. like you're sitting at the table at the yeah. first row. Um, and it's, we go up there at least once a year uh, to visit family and friends. And, uh, you know, I'll spend every evening that Cafe Lena is open mm -hmm. uh, in Cafe Lena. So, yeah. Um, is Lena, I don't, I haven't been aware of it in a long time. Is Lena even still involved? I don't even know. Oh, Lena's been gone for a while. She yeah. has. Okay. Yeah. I kind of thought so, but yeah. I wasn't really sure. Yeah. But it's 60 years old. Wow. You know, and it's still going strong. They just keep growing. And I'm sort of proud of it because my uh, musician, uh, producer brother uh, does the live streams for them. So oh, no yeah. kidding. Oh, yeah. cool. That's so I have fun. a little connection there as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lena's is a cool place. It yes. really, really is. I'm glad that they continued it after she she passed on. Yes. Because it, it is so novel. Novel is the best word I can think of to yep. describe it. I've yep. never seen anything like it. Have you ever seen anything like it anywhere? We have something that's fairly close here in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, but it still doesn't have that same camaraderie. I mean, there's something about that energy there. Yeah. And there's always somebody who, at least at this point, who still knows Lena or knew wow. Lena. Um, <laughs> you know, I know eventually that's, you know, that's going to fade away. But when you hear the stories uh, of people who actually worked with her mm -hmm. um, and they say that, um, oh, his name just escaped me. Bob Dylan. They say that. Bob Dylan became the person he is because of Lena. Yeah, Lena, that's true. Yeah. Lena pushed him, she you know, did. and and when you hear that, you think if, if anybody does wants to look at the history of it, you know, Lena was this big heavy set woman, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh she just knew what she wanted to do, but she would she would tell musicians, you're good, no, you're not good. Mm -hmm. Um and Dylan, she really wanted him to make it and yeah. did so yeah kudos I, to her i'm curious to know if you know the answer to this i don't know the answer to this i've heard this is true but i don't know if it's true um and again we're, we're talking about musicians from our generation right. so yeah. you know, the youngers may not know what we're talking about but arlo guthrie who wrote alice's restaurant yes. i'm told that part of the inspiration for alice's restaurant was cafe lena do you know if that's true i i think it was not well, it was Cafe Lena, but downstairs from Cafe Lena is, well, I can't think of the name of the restaurant now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, Lena's husband was involved in the restaurant downstairs. Okay. And if I can think of it, all I know is chicken and waffles is the main dish of that <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I, that I'm pretty sure I, I don't think the whole story came out of that, but I think it was in, an inspiration in the yep. way he, he put that story together. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> everybody wild. check out Cafe Lena. It's a great place to go and the music never dies. Yeah, really? Well, everybody should check out uh, new Cleveland radio too. Well, I mean, we have... 12 years you've been doing it. That that's, I mean, I've done it 10. I know what's involved in doing it for 10. So I add on a couple of years and I'm, that's impressive. That's well, really impressive. You know, Again, it's something that I always wanted to do. And I'll never forget when Jane Pauley was on the Today Show. Hmm. Um, I would sit and watch her in the morning and I would just like want to be her hmm. so much. And I can't tell you how many times I would say something to my parents. You know, if you only would have believed in me, that Aww. would be me. And my parents she, she knew. was quite a role model, by the way. She, oh, yeah. She and was she a fabulous still, role model. And she's still on TV. She's yeah, now yeah. on CBS. Yeah. Um, but I think my parents knew me well enough back in the day that, yes, it was something I wanted to do, but I probably didn't have, you know, the energy that I have today to mm -hmm. want to do it because I still wanted to play. I still wanted to go out. I still wanted to fall in love. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, um, if I wasn't in such a secure relationship all these years, I'm not sure I could be doing what I'm doing today because mm -hmm. there are days that um, it takes away from family and friends. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we have to make choices in our lives. Right. We have to decide what's important. And exactly. it's an ongoing process. It's not, I think that's one thing that a lot of people get tripped on, tripped up on. They they assume they have to make one big choice and then you know they're, they're kind of restricted by that for life. Right. Whereas the truth is we're we're encountering choices on a daily basis. And it's really up to us to decide, do I want to continue this path I've I've been on? Do I want to change the path? What which which is the direction that seems best to me? And then this is a topic, uh, a subtopic we really haven't gone into here, but it's kind of like a, it's it's sort of like an assumed subtopic, I think, from my perspective. What do we feel deep down? What's going on inside of us? Because that that deep down inside of us, that that inner being, as it's often called, you know, the higher power, I don't care what you call it, that connection that we have, when we can learn to get guidance through that, when we can learn to get um, signals through that, and to utilize those signals to recognize, wow, this really is what I like. This really is where my passion is. And then to do that on a regular basis, that's pretty much what you're doing. Well, that, that, that's it, what you're, you turned your life into. Well, and I realized for me, I had to mm -hmm. because I was always comparing myself to other people mm. and I wasn't, I wasn't getting to what I thought was the right level. Mm. And when I realized it's not so much that I want to be like other people, Okay. I want to be me, but I want, there's certain things I want to do maybe like other people, Okay, but I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. Um, and one example that I, you know, look back on, uh, when I first started college, um, my brother and sister-in-law lost their first child to sudden infant death. And I felt so connected to the child that, I decided to start a support group on campus mm. for people to understand what SIDS was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know myself. I had mm -hmm. to gather the information, but I knew that I had to heal because mm -hmm. I was there to support my brother and sister-in-law, but they weren't supporting my healing. My parents weren't supporting my healing. Everybody had their own grief. And I realized I had to do something Otherwise, I wasn't, I would, I would never resolve what I was feeling. And so I started this group and I had people say to me, well, what do you really know about it? And my answer was, I don't, but we're going to learn together and mm -hmm. we're going to learn how to get through this together. And, you know, that's basically what I did when I, you know, said to my son, okay, we're going to podcast together. We're going to put this together and you do the sports and I'll do what I'm going to do. Um, but also realizing that it had to feel good. It had to yes. be right. And that's a terrific thing that you continue to do to this day. And I'm sure you'll keep doing. Um, I, one thing I want, I want to tell you that I, I, usually tell guests and i think it's really appropriate in your case um one of the things that happens when we do what we do and or when you know you're a blogger or you're putting out a product and you have a website and all that kind of stuff um very often people are putting out all kinds of content that is being consumed by people they've never met and that they'll never see and so on and we don't really realize how important that is so what i like to say is on their behalf thank you for all of the content you've been putting out and that thank you continue you. to put out and, and you know it's it's important. So even though you've never heard from them, you'll never see them. I know they appreciate you. Well, I appreciate that, and you know I don't know them by name, as you say. Right. But I do every once in a while hear through the grapevine. You know, yeah, it's fun. my cousin was listening, my mother was listening, and wow, you said some of the things they've been thinking about for a long time. And it's like, That's well, great. you know what? Let's keep sharing and. Uh, this was wonderful, Walt. I am so glad that we got together today. I'm it sorry your, your partner wasn't here. Yeah, uh, that, that's all right. I'll have to, you know, listen to his music here in the near future. Yeah. I would love to hear his his music and maybe even have, an, uh, have him on my show and talk sure. about his music. Okay. That, well, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, thank you for sharing about newclevenradio.net. Good luck uh, with your continuing podcasting career. And boy, I think it's going to be great. Just go. With I appreciate it. it. Have a all great right. day. Thanks thank so you. much. Thank you to our podcast listeners everywhere. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.